Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is David Brown, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute to this talk on the Jewish Renaissance in Weimar, Germany. Um, uh, we have uh, a, a very uh, esteemed, uh, distinguished panel, and it's going to be a great discussion. So I'll uh, just say a couple words um, about the occasion for this event. Um, and uh, then we'll get underway. Um, as many of you know, uh, uh, the year 2021 is the uh, 1,700th anniversary of a document from 321, uh, a, a Roman edict issued in the city of Cologne uh, that establishes uh, the presence of a Jewish communi community there in, in 321 CE. Um, and that, uh, of course, is the first evidence in the historical record of Jewish life in the area of uh, uh, modern day Germany um, and in, in Germans, what became German speaking regions in general. And as part of um, uh, a number of activities across uh, Europe and the world uh, marking this occasion, uh, the Leo Beck Institute has been uh, uh, involved in the Shared History Project, which is an online exhibition, which all throughout the year has been documenting this history um, uh, one week at a time uh, through an object that is revealed every week. Um, and we have uh, covered uh, about 16 centuries of history up until now, and we've reached the um, uh, the era of the Weimar Republic and National Socialism. Um, and we have invited a couple of key contributors to the Shared History Project, uh, uh, along uh, with some other uh, members of our uh, scholarly community um, to talk to you about one aspect uh, of, this, uh, of this period, um, which is actually something that uh, didn't get um, quite the attention it deserves in the exhibit. So I think we'll be able to rectify that today and maybe talk about how some of the objects in the exhibit uh, do reflect on that, uh, on the history of um, the sort of uh, efflorescence of, of Jewish life and communal activity uh, in the Weimar Republic. Um, so I'm not going to introduce all our panelists. I'll just introduce you to our um, moderator. We're uh, very lucky to have Miriam Ruhr up with us. Uh, who is the director of the Moses Mendelssohn Center for European Jewish Studies in Potsdam. Uh, her research interests include the German, Jew German Jewish history, contemporary history, and especially the history of and post history of National Socialism, as well as migration and gender history. Uh, her current research project deals on the history of statelessness. She is the editor of academic journals, including Werkstattgeschichte, Ashkenaz, and the Leo Beck Institute yearbook. Uh, as well as the online source edition, Key Documents on German Jewish History. Um, Miriam also wrote the introductory essay on this period of uh, the Weimar Republic and National Socialism for the Shared History Project. And um, she's going to chair this discussion. And we really have uh, some, of the, some of the people who have um, really defined and made uh, really seminal contributions to this area of study. So I think you're in for a treat, but Miriam will tell you more about the other panelists. So thank you, Miriam. Thank you very much, David. And uh, welcome also from my side to all participants of this evenings here or lunch uh, time talk uh, over on your side of this world. Um, I'm joining you from Berlin and actually from one of the most Jewish neighborhoods of Berlin. And uh, much of this neighborhood, it's Wilmersdorf. Many of you may know it. It's Charlottenburg, Wilmersdorf. It's, it's the Old West. And it's very much the old Weimar Jewish Berlin. But today, if we walk around the city or the neighborhood right here, this story is mostly been told by stumbling stones and not by Jewish landmarks themselves anymore. So this is um, this is where I'm joining you from, um, uh, from one of the uh, former 
Berlin and Weimar Jewish hotspots, so to speak. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to this panel because um, in our perception of Jew German Jewish history, mostly it really is always this intersection of Berlin, um, culture, vibrant life uh, that we combine with Weimar. Or if we think about the Weimar period in Jewish history, it, it very much is Berlin that we think of. Uh, not only by contemporary series, just uh, such as Babylon Berlin, that probably not only here in Germany, but also uh, in the US, many people saw. Um, so today we are gonna look at the Weimar Republic and we will try to not look at it the way I started introducing this panel by, we will try to not look at it at, from the lens of post 33, but really look at it as, as an era in which Jewish life finally could expect to, to, to live freely and to evolve freely and um, develop something that Michael Brenner coined the Jewish Renaissance, uh, a, a, a term that was formerly used by um, Martin Buber, but I'm sure that Michael is gonna mention it. And we are not only having Michael Brenner as one of our panelists today, but also because we are more or less celebrating 25 years of uh, the publication of his book that uh, used the, the term of the Jewish Renaissance to talk about in Jewish Weimar Republic. Um, so I'm very happy really to thank and, and grateful to the LBI to having put this panel together and those wonderful panelists. Um, let me introduce those three guests to you and then tell you briefly on how we thought of proceeding to this uh, evening or afternoon. Um, Michael Brenner, I'm, I'm sure that usually I would not need to introduce him at all because most of you, or if not all of you, have heard or read of him or his books. Michael Brenner is uh, the international president of the Leo Beck Institute and uh, the Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies at the U American University in Washington, DC, and also professor or director um, of, of uh, the Center of Jewish History and Culture at the Ludwig Maximilians University here in Germany in Munich, uh, which is one of the scholarly centers of um, German Jewish history scholarship today in Germany. And um, nine of his books have been translated into not only English, but many more languages. And one of the, the most, I, I will now not only name the, the most famous book because it's related to our panel, which was The Renaissance of Jewish Culture in Weimar Germany, A Short History of the Jews. And even the subtitles, subtitle already tells you something that I meant by saying, if we think of German Jewish history, we very often think of the Weimar Republic and focus on it. Uh, our next um, panelist uh, is Kerry Wallach. She's associate professor of German at Gettysburg College. And um, she, she is well known for her book that I also use in, in teaching in Germany, uh, which, is, which is always a challenge because usually it's, it's really tough to, to bring students to read English uh, texts, but I, I, I love lose, using it. And she's the author of Passing Illusions, Jewish Visibility in Weimar, Germany, uh, which was published three years ago, four years ago. And she's also on the academic advisory board of the Leo Beck Institute. So you see we're we are all more or less involved with the Leo Beck Institute. And our third um, panelist is Rachel Selig, who joins us from Toronto, uh, where she lives and works as a literary scholar, a teacher, and a writer. And so she's not only working as a scholar on culture, but she's also producing cultural documents because she, among or her other work also writes children's books. But she's known to you maybe not as an author of children's books, but as the author of Strangers in Berlin, Modern Jewish Literature Between East and West, 1919 to 1933. So we thought of now proceeding like this, that Michael will give us like a general overview of his thesis and approach or take on German Jewish history in the Weimar Republic. 
um, 25 years ago, and he, he will also assess questions of how the scholarship changed and, and like take a new uh, angle uh, on, on the scholarship uh, that, that emerged and developed, of course, in the past 25 years. And Carrie Wallach and uh, Rachel Zielik will then lead us into their specific fields, which is visual history in Carrie's case and um, Hebrew and Yiddish literature uh, as a focus of our talk in, in Rachel's case. And we will then have time to talk on our panel and then open up after some 40 minutes um, to the audience as well. So I'm very much looking forward to Michael's input and each speaker is gonna talk about five to 10 minutes just so you, you're prepared. So Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. And it's really an honor to be in this wonderful group. Um, I, uh, when, when I first uh, was invited to this panel, I only realized that it is actually 25 years since the publication of this book, which makes me uh, wonder. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really never uh, thought about it, but thank you for mentioning this. Um, so I, I wanna say a few words about um, the book, which you know, after 25 years is an interesting endeavor. I haven't uh, I think spoken about it for quite a few years, uh, but also maybe a few words what had happened since then in scholarship. Uh, when I when I wrote the book, uh, it started as a dissertation at Columbia University. Um, I I realized, to my own astonishment, back then in the 1990s, um, that while there is or there was, of course, a literature written on Jews in Weimar Germany, most of it, almost all of it. Uh, focused on what you might call Jewish contributions to German culture, or as you mentioned before, Miriam, or Jews in politics or anti-Semitism. Of course, always with the year 1933 um, somehow overshadowing <clears throat> the years before. And what I wanted to do in the book is to um, portray German Jews not as a community that in a way was reminded by Hitler and the Nazis that they actually were Jewish. Yes, there were those of course as well. But what I realized doing my research is that there was a large movement, let's call it back to, Jew to, to Jewishness, not necessarily Judaism as a religion. Um, and uh, I try to concentrate not only on the very famous projects like the Frankfurt uh, Free, um, uh, the, the Frankfurt Lehrhaus uh, under Franz Rosenzweig or Martin Buber or other um, famous people, mostly men, of course. Uh, but I try to concentrate also on other endeavors. Uh, so when I wrote about the Frankfurt uh, uh, Freies Jüdisches Lehrhaus, I also try to show what was going on in communities like Mannheim or uh, Munich or Cologne. And they were very interesting projects. What I discovered is that in each of those projects, their own ed Jewish adult education movement, which was trying to lead assimilated Jews in a way back to not practicing Judaism, but to a knowledge um, of uh, what it means to be Jewish, uh, that they all had their own emphases on music, on art, on literature. It was different in each uh, city. And then I also, speaking about these um, endeavors, I, I, I also tried to portray some of the literary um, cultural efforts, uh, which were not Jewish writers happening to write, uh, in German, of course, but Jewish writers trying to express their Jewishness in German. And the same in uh, the realm of art or music. And it was very interesting. Uh, all of those uh, endeavors resulted in a lot of innovative, um, innovative attempts to create modern Jewish culture, to create a Jewish culture 
that was in tune with the modernity of the Weimar years. So when Arnold Schoenberg wrote his 12 tone music, some of the Jewish composers for Jewish music uh, in a way tried not exactly to copy 12 tone music, but modern attempts to compose, for example, also liturgical music. We've seen already one of the modern uh, Haggadot, one of the modern um, products of Jewish art, combining it with, in this case, uh, the ritual of Passover. Um, but there was also an attempt to play with modern techniques like recording, recording synagogue services, for example. And there was an interest in a lot of, um, uh, I would say, um, so-called exotic Jews, Jews from Yemen, Jews from uh, the uh, Asian parts of Russia, um, but also for some, what was exotic were the Austrian, were the East European Jews, and the encounter with them meant a lot. So these were some of the um, some of the attempts I tried to portray and analyze in the book. Um, also, by the way, the development of the Jewish community as an institution. I think that is something very much changing after World War I. A Jewish community like Berlin with 170,000 members is like a, a, its own city in a way with their welfare services. Of course, with their education, Jewish education really expanded dramatically after World War I, also as a result of anti-Semitism, but also as a result of growing Zionism and of the influx of East European Jews. Um, and also, um, uh, for example, the, the different um, parties competing for leadership within the Jewish communities, and so on and so on. Uh, so that was 25 years ago. And um, of course, much has been written uh, since then. And I think in the last 25 years, our image and our picture of Weimar Germany's Jewish life has been so much more refined, uh, thanks also to the works of our other participants in this panel. Um, we have really, uh, there, there's so much more on uh, visual culture, on the gender history of the Jews of Weimar Germany, also religious life, and also the um, aspects which I touched upon a little bit in my book, but I knew that was just the tip of the iceberg, uh, uh, Yiddish and Hebrew writers in Berlin, when Berlin, especially in the early 1920s, was the center uh, for Hebrew literature um, worldwide. And for a few years, um, for example, Chaim Nachman Bialik, the most important Hebrew writer, poet at the time, celebrated his 50th birthday in the Berlin Philharmonics. And uh, you had uh, basically everyone, everybody living there, or Shmuel Yosef Agnon, uh, later uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, lived for 12 years in Berlin, and sorry, in Germany. It's not only, and that's important, not always Berlin. Uh, he lived in several places, and the last few years in Bad Homburg, near Frankfurt, uh, until his house with his uh, library burned down and that was actually, uh, that triggered his um, aliyah to Palestine in 1924. Who knows if he, like some of his siblings, sisters especially, might have stayed in Germany otherwise. So um, I, I, I may just stop here. I think my time is up, um, but I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss this. And maybe one last word, when I looked at the objects uh, of this really wonderful virtual exhibition, a shared history project. It seems that the, that the older image of Jews contributing to German culture is still very much there because I didn't see any objects for this period that really um, reflected the renaissance of Jewish culture uh, as, um, uh, as, as I just tried to outline it uh, for the years 1918 to 33. Thank you very much, Michael. This was a great start to, to this, to, to now go into further detail of those two case studies, so to speak, that we're gonna uh, 
have a brief um, insight now. So I think we'll start with Rachel and literature. No, nope. Carrie, you want to go first? Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Miriam. And um, let me just first say it's really an honor to be on this panel and um, to be in conversation with scholars whose work I read and cite and respect and engage with every day. So what an honor to be here. Um, my talk today is going to focus on the visual culture of the Weimar period, and I'll talk mostly about art, um, which is what I look at in my second book project. Uh, and so I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who's here to talk about film um, or other aspects of visual culture photography, uh, but I'm happy to talk about those in the, in the Q&A uh, some more. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share some slides. So let me go ahead and get that started. Is that working? Everyone can see that? OK, great. Um, so uh, to begin, I just wanted to say that, uh, indeed, many Jewish artists and others help to advance a collective Jewish identity, the kind that Michael has just been talking about. Um, within the visual culture of the Weimar Republic in a number of ways. And of course, um, works of art represent many of these, uh, but just to, to put out there, um, to state the obvious, uh, we also have visual culture in many other forms, including in uh, illustrated periodicals and the press, um, which I've worked with extensively. Um, and we see a wide range of visual culture in those sources. We see um, art and culture journals, and I know Rachel will talk a little more about um, some of the, the Yiddish and Hebrew contributions to this. Um, but we also see plenty of um, different German Jewish periodicals, uh, both newspapers and magazines from the Familienblatt to Das Jüdische Magazine, a short-lived magazine up in the corner um, that published color illustrations, uh, showing us both um, representations of works of art and also um, showcasing some of the photography of this period as well. So thanks to the new technologies of this period, we were able to see reproductions of art in many different forms um, and to think about visual culture in, in different ways. We of course have in this period um, a number of prominent German Jewish artists who are worth mentioning just because everyone's already heard of them. Um, and these are the artists who contributed, some of them contributed even primarily or more, at least initially, to um, mainstream modernist art movements um, before we sort of think about their contributions to the Jewish Renaissance. Um, so we think about someone like an impressionist painter like Max Liebermann. Um, we think about Elsa Lasker Schuler, who's an expressionist poet, but who also created drawings and other works of art. Um, or someone like Ludwig Meidner, whose um, painting of Leo Beck is now on the cover of Michael Meyer's biography of Leo Beck, so we're more familiar with this painting. But we think about the ways that their art um, contributed to mainstream German culture, and we also think about what that meant for um, the Jewish community and how the Jewish community was receiving and responding their works, um, especially when they focus specifically on Jewish topics or Jewish figures. We also have um, in Germany at this time, and this is one of the um, contributions that I'm trying to make with my current project, we also have um, any number of artists who have connections to Eastern Europe, whether they were born in Eastern Europe or born in parts of um, Eastern Germany that were sort of border zones or closer to Poland, um, or simply have other connections to Eastern Europe. They visited it um, in their time, in their service in the First World War, et cetera. Um, so the, these encounters with the East European Jews that Michael referenced um, led to a desire to think through what those encounters meant, to think through the sort of authenticity or authentic connections to traditional Jewish culture that East European Jews represented. Um, and that ended up sort of taking the form of, in this case, we see some scenes of village life or shtetl life, um, with uh, always with traditional Jews sort of at the forefront. Um, and we see those in different forms here. Um, and particularly during the early 1920s, when printmaking and graphic art flourished, uh, in part due to the economic circumstances um, during the time of hyperinflation, we have um, 
art forms flourishing that are less expensive to produce, um, many artists were creating illustrations both for uh, special editions of Jewish themed books and portfolios um, that contributed to the surge in bibliophilic book production at this time, um, and also uh, independent prints um, as well. And here we see a couple of different um, rituals that relate to the Sabbath by Hermann Struck, Jakob Steinhardt, Josef Gutko, and Rachel Shalit Markus. Um, we see them portraying Jewish Sabbath rituals and traditions in etchings and woodcuts and lithographs. Um, the Havdalah lithograph by Rachel Shalit in the upper right corner is taken from her portfolio of illustrations of Heinrich Heine, Heine's Hebrew melodies, for example. And I'm working on a book on Rachel Shalit Markus and I'm hoping to demonstrate uh, that Shalit was one of a number of women artists who were involved in the creation of Weimar Jewish culture. Um, but Shalit, I think, is unique insofar as she was one of the most important female artists from, East Europe, from Eastern Europe who was active in Weimar Germany. So when we think about Weimar Jewish culture and Weimar German culture, maybe that also extends to include those um, who were not native speakers of German who did not hail from Germany originally. In um, different works of art, we see many biblical fi figures represented. We see um, in, in these particular ones, um, Cain and Dina and Moses. Um, many of the engagement, many artists engage with biblical figures uh, in, in using different media. Um, and sometimes they were actually illustrating literary works on some of these subjects. We also find any number of images reflecting a turn toward traditional Judaism, whether it was a fascination with it or people actually turning toward traditional Judaism themselves. Um, we see observant Jews and uh, most, mostly Jewish men, um, although represented by some female artists as well, uh, praying or studying um, presumably Jewish texts. The last image I wanted to show you it, here um, shows actually, these are all paintings made by Jewish artists uh, of people reading and engaging with uh, different forms of literature. Some might be Jewish texts or are marked Jewish through other parts of the image, um, like Yuli Wolfton's um, image on the left. But on the right, we see an image of um, someone reading Heinrich Heine aloud, and we can think about what kind of contribution that makes in thinking through the role of literature and the way that literature is represented in art and this broader engagement with literature and intellectual questions and how it's reflected by Jewish artists. And what these three paintings actually have in common is that they were part of the collection of the Berlin Jewish Museum that opened in 1933, uh, which finally constituted a dedicated space for Jewish art in Berlin. And prior to that, um, many Berlin artists were able to show their work in other Jewish settings, such as exhibitions at B'nai B'rith lodges um, that were held to support Jewish artists during tough times and educate Weimar publics about Jewish art. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't have time to address anything related to film or photography. Um, there's so much more to consider in terms of visual culture, um, but I wanted to stay within my time limits and I'm looking forward to hearing from Rachel. And um, well, visual culture in the broadest sense does not does can include film, but doesn't have to include film. <laughs> so um, we we can also address this in the discussion further on. And now I look forward to moving even further east, or or looking at what what came from the east to Weimar Republic and the Jewish Renaissance. So Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, just like to reiterate what Carrie said, it really is um, a pleasure and an honor to be on this panel um, with the rest of you. Um, and, uh, you know, we we're talking about anniversaries, right? 1700 years since uh, of German Jewish life in German speaking lands, 25 years since the publication of Michael Brenner's book, which um, for me personally was an inspiration and a kind of point of departure for my own research. Um, and I'd like to add to that list uh, 100 years, um, pretty much exactly since the arrival of some of the most prominent names in Yiddish and Hebrew letters in Berlin, including 
Dovid Bergelson and Nachaim Nachman Bialik, who both arrived in 1921. Um, so I have the chance to talk to you about Jewish culture in Weimar Germany, but uh, Dafka, to give you a non-German word, not about German Jewish culture per se, um, because as Michael Brenner has already mentioned, when we talk about the Jewish Renaissance in Weimar Germany, we're actually talking about much more than um, that classic hyphenated term, uh, German Jewish. Um, so I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen with you as well. Let's hope that this all goes smoothly. Um, okay, can everyone see that okay? Just give me a nod or a thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to start by just giving you, sharing a small example with you. In 1926, the Yiddish writer David Bergelson published an essay entitled Three Centers, Drei Zentren in Yiddish, in the inaugural issue of In Harness, a journal for the communist worker reader. In it, Bergelson dismissed the United States and Poland in favor of Soviet Russia as the only viable center for Yiddish literature. Curiously though, he made no mention in the essay of the place in which he wrote it, Weimar, Germany. Bergelson spent more time in interwar Berlin than perhaps any other Yiddish writer of his stature. Uh, Michael Brenner mentioned Agnon, who spent 12 years a little bit earlier, um, and Bergelson was sort of his Yiddish counterpart, also matching him 12 years that he spent um, arriving in Berlin in 1921 in the wake of revolution, civil war, and pogroms. And he remained there until Hitler rose to power in 1933. And who knows, he may have stayed longer um, had that not happened. Bergelson was very much embedded in Berlin's cultural scene. And yet, as its absence in the essay Three Centers reveals, he never saw Germany as a permanent home for Yiddish. So I start with this example because I think it tells us a lot about how Yiddish and Hebrew migrant, migrant writers viewed Weimar culture and their place within it. For them, Weimar and Berlin was Weimar, Weimar was Berlin, as the historian Eric Weitz has written. Berlin was not so much a home as a threshold, as I've called it in my book, between East and West um, and between the old imperial order and a new nation state model. The fact that Berlin was only a provisional home by no means detracts from its significance though. In Berlin, these Jewish emigre writers were at the center of everything and also relegated to the margins. And this peculiar sort of outsider insider status really motored their modernist contributions. 1920s Berlin was the place to be. Right. The young poet Moishe Kulbach, who arrived there from Vilna in 1920, announced very proudly upon arrival in a letter to his French Moulin Niger, I am now in Berlin. Finally, I have arrived in Europe. I mean, for him, this was the epicenter of Europe. And Kulbach, of course, could barely make ends meet in Berlin, um, but his brief time there was extremely productive and very experimental. From the shadowy margins, he was able to imagine his native white Russia, Reisen, from a critical distance and recreate it in highly experimental verse. The Hebrew poet Leah Goldberg, who left Kovno to study in Berlin, she arrived a bit later um, in 1930, wrote upon arrival in her diary, I'm in Berlin, this says so much, no more gray boredom, here it seems life can change and it's possible to breathe freely. Berlin for these writers was both the center and the periphery. And as such, it was a productive space for a literature without a national home. And I think it's very important to remember that both Yiddish and Hebrew literature were homeless essentially at this time. It wasn't just the cultural and political openness that drew these writers and also publishers to Berlin. There were some economic reasons too. Ironically, the economic burden that encumbered um, the Weimar Republic after World War I was also a blessing for foreigners. 
the relatively low cost of printing, um, the lack of, of censorship, um, made Berlin a publisher's paradise. And during this, the high point of um, German and Hebrew, sorry, Yiddish and uh, Hebrew publishing, uh, between 1920 and 1924, Berlin was second only to Warsaw as the largest producer of Yiddish books and periodicals worldwide. Michael Brenner mentioned Bialik's uh, arrival um, when he re relocated to Berlin uh, from Odessa in 1921, he brought his own publishing house with him, De Vier, and the only other option he was aware would have been Tel Aviv. And to him, the choice was pretty clear as this quote reveals. He wrote in a letter, do they actually print books in Palestine? Paper is far too expensive there. Um, and this from the great national Hebrew bard, right? Um, they had to name a street after Bialik to get him to even come to Palestine. Um, and so he, he was choosing Berlin over Palestine, which is quite remarkable. The poet Uri Tzvi Greenberg, who's remembered as a radical right-wing Zionist, arrived in Berlin in 1922. He'd been forced into exile from Warsaw after publishing the anti-Christian poem Uri Tzvi Farin Selim, Uri Tzvi Before the Cross, um, in his journal Albatros. Um, so he picked up, relocated to Berlin. The next issue of Albatros was published in Berlin. Um, but Greenberg, who lived in Germany on a false passport, saw himself as a kind of fugitive and the experience of exile and statelessness inspired his turn toward Zionist politics. And he later would remember that it was in Berlin that he became a Zionist. Um, this also marked a shift in his writing from writing predominantly in Yiddish to writing predominantly in Hebrew. Um, so it was in Berlin that he said farewell to Malchus von Salem, the kingdom of the cross, as he referred to Europe in Yiddish and announced his departure for Malchut Ivrit, the Hebrew kingdom in Hebrew. Weimar Berlin did leave its imprint on these writers just as they left their imprint on it. For instance, the primitivist and apocalyptic motifs of Moshe Kulbach's poetry reveal the influence of German expressionism. The theme of urban anomie in David Bergelson's stories bears the hallmark of Berlin's boarding house culture, something we remember mainly from Christopher Isherwood's stories. Um, and the looming shadow of totalitarianism is felt throughout Lea Goldberg's posthumous novel, Avedot, Losses. German Jewish writers and East European migrant writers mostly moved in separate circles but meaningful relationships between them were formed. Um, a couple of the more well-documented examples are the relationships between Elsa Lasker Schuler and Uri Tzvi Greenberg, and between David Bergelson and Alfred Dublin. When we look back at Weimar Jewish culture, we have to remember that we're talking not simply about German language culture, um, but about a transnational Jewish culture. And I think this comes through very strongly also in, in what Carrie is working on. Visual culture, of course, is without language, right? So it's transnational, I would say, by definition. Um, Weimar Berlin was a space in which both native and migrant Jewish writers were negotiating between the past and their future, between exile and home. And the breadth and reach of Weimar Jewish culture um, perhaps even the legacy of Weimar Jewish culture really extends beyond national and linguistic borders. Um, and uh, so I thank you for my time and, and we'll, I'll, I'll defer back to Miriam and hopefully we can start our discussion, which I look forward to. Thank you very much, Rachel and, and all three of you actually. It's really a great opener to definitely more than an hour of discussion and talking and conversation, I'm sure. But uh, we'll, um, my, my first question actually is when I listened to you, I, at some point I started thinking, well, we are, religion is missing completely from our picture. I mean, you, you Carrie, you had one, you had a few litho lithographies where we could see religion does play a role or it depicts religious motives. But uh, maybe, maybe we can take a step back and not talk about who contributed to Jewish Renaissance in the Weimar Republic, but maybe 
which Jews did and which didn't. Like, who, 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 who were the Jews bringing this forward and who was not? How were those inner Jewish differences maybe playing a role? Michael? Yes, thanks. And, and, and thanks for pointing also to religion. Uh, again, I, as I just mentioned briefly, some of the um, articles and maybe also some books in the meantime have pointed out to forms of Jewish religion developing in this time. Michael Meyer, uh, one of them, as in so many other areas, contributed also to the innovations of um, Jewish life uh, in terms of modernization of religion in this period, um, but others as well, of course. Uh, let us not forget, if we think about also East European Jews, um, in Weimar Germany, you find uh, not only a Leo Beck and, um, uh, you know, Rabbi Prince, who is a much younger and a rabbi becoming fashionable also among the young people, but it's also home to, 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 to so many diverse people, uh, like the future Lubavitcher Rebbe, who studies in Berlin, um, or um, Arav Yeshua Heschel, who is uh, also in Germany at the time, um, and, and many other Orthodox thinkers as well. So I think this is an important uh, point you're raising, and I think it is something which systematically uh, has really not been dealt with. And in terms of um, who contributed to this culture, it's very hard to, um, to pin it down because as you all know, um, the rift goes through the families. The famous example often given is the Sholem family where one brother was Gerhard who later became Gershom and uh, definitely one of the most innovative thinkers coming of age um, around uh, World War I and the early Weimar years and then leaving for Jerusalem and becoming the foremost probably researcher of, of, of Jewish studies in the 20th century. Uh, but his brother Werner was a member of the Communist Party for the, on, in, in the Reichstag. And, and his two other brothers were politically more like liberal and German nationalists. So you have the four different uh, um, directions in, in one family. So I think it's very hard to pin down. It went through families. Uh, the interest in things Jewish, in things that their parents and often grandparents had thrown overboard now became an interest for many young Jewish intellectuals, but not for all. Franz Rosenzweig was interested in it um, against, in a way, the will of his father, just like Sholem uh, or Kafka, for that matter, uh, was not in Weimar, Germany, but in Prague. But he did actually attend uh, in Berlin in the early 1920s, the classes of the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, a liberal rabbinical seminary. Carrie, did you want? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think what I would just say to that is um, when we think about relationships to religion, we also can can think a little bit more broadly than just traditional religious practice and think about the forms of Jewish community that emerged and the ways that people were involved in um, in culture through those gatherings of Jewish community. So, for example, going to either a synagogue or a Jewish organization. Um, a meeting of a Jewish organization to hear a lecture about Jewish culture um, is something that that happened among also what we might call more acculturated Jews um, who weren't necessarily uh, as interested in in um, Sabbath observance, but who were interested perhaps in in turning up for a lecture by a political or cultural figure um, or someone speaking to something related to a Jewish topic. So the the Jewish the interest in Jewish culture. Um, not to say that it replaced religion, but certainly supplemented or complemented uh, any kind of interest in, in Jewish religion and tradition. Um, at least that's my understanding. I think that's a great point um, that Carrie makes. And I, I think that that probably resonates with uh, certainly a lot of North American Jews. I mean, it's not unlike the kind of religious, and I put religious in, in scare quotes, um, identity that I think a lot of um, Jews today sort of would, would describe themselves as, as having. Um, one thing I was going to add to the question 
um, is, you know, when I was doing my research on really, I wasn't just looking at um, Hebrew and Yiddish writers, but trying to understand the encounter, or perhaps the missed encounter between German Jewish writers and East European Jewish writers, and why it was that at times they seemed to be meeting, but at other times seemed to be kind of passing like two ships in the night. And one of the things that I realized is that German, many German Jews who were interested in East European Jewish culture were looking for something in particular that their East European contemporaries couldn't really provide for them. In other words, they were looking for a kind of uh, maybe inspired by Buber's Hasidic tales. You know, they were looking for a kind of romanticized image of East European Jewish culture. And that's not what people like Kulbach and Bergelson um, were interested in producing. They were there really as kind of um, stateless Europeans trying to figure out where the place of a Yiddish and Hebrew modernist culture should be. And so I think in the, you know, the, the kind of secularizing impulse that a lot of these East European Jewish writers were propelled by um, was exactly what German, many German Jews um, like Rosenzweig, you know, and others of his generation, Kafka included, were, were actually reacting against. Um, so in many ways, I think religion per se does play into all of this, but sometimes in more subtle ways than just, you know, religious practice. you're making because if we think of the discussion after the war like whether there was a German Jewish dialogue and, and a conversation between uh, German Jews and German non-Jews uh, what, what you're stressing now is complicating the picture that there was not even a conversation or a functioning conversation between Jews and Jews uh, because they really looked for something else than what they what they were seeing actually like even in the same pictures um so maybe we can talk briefly on about the milieus that we are talking about because you rachel at the end of your input you said uh, that you're you're seeing the work you're looking at as something that is not only homeless but also cra crossing national and even religious lines so i would wonder more or less in, in both your cases, Carrie and Rachel, how how you see, yeah, what what are what what are crossing the lines beyond the Jewish realm? Like if we look at at, at non-Jewish developments in the same period. Because if we think of the title of this exhibit that we are that this event is, event is part of, shared history, um, it, it it has the presumption that there is something shared. But if we if we don't only look at shared, but just add happening simultaneously, maybe maybe looking at it from this angle. Maybe I'll respond to that um, and just talk about the, the art for a moment. Um, for example, um, we saw uh, several works of art by Ludwig Meidner and Jakob Steinhardt who were involved in um, various different expressionist groups, um, including one uh, called Die Pathetica in the early 1910s, slightly before the Weimar period, um, uh, together with a non-Jewish colleague of theirs. Um, and they were um, very much engaged in the creation of German expressionism in the sort of some of the founding works um, dealing with and responding to anxieties about World War One and um, sort of a apocalyptic tendencies and not all of that and really much of it wasn't specifically Jewish or uniquely Jewish so they were very much involved in in the emergence of these artistic modernist trends um, that that weren't Jewish necessarily um, or, or at all uh, but then they also have sort of separate works um, or some of their works could be considered within a Jewish context within a broader Jewish context um, both from subject matter or from publication context. Um, sometimes it just depended on um, the title of a work might tell you how to interpret it. Um, but it was the same with many of these artists. Uh, before 1933, many, um, many Jewish artists were even more involved in mainstream movements than they were in 
thinking about Jewish subjects. Um, and, and in fact, in some of them, we see a turn to Jewish subjects only after 1933 um, later on. Uh, but many, um, for example, uh, Rafael Shalit Marcos, who I'm, who I'm focusing on in my, in my current project, um, really found a way, at least um, in the 1920s, to create some works of art that were, or some book illustrations that were meant for mainstream audiences. She illustrated Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, things that were not specifically Jewish at all. Um, but then she also illustrated uh, Jewish literature by Heine, by Bialik, by um, Sholem Aleichem. So really uh, every kind of different Jewish literature that, that was available to her. Um, so she's doing these simultaneously. She's One day she's illustrating um, Tolstoy and the next day she's working on Heine. Um, there's no um, divide in her life between the Jewish and the non-Jewish. It's just which project is she working on today? Uh, so we can think about these, these artists as contributing in many different ways and some of them dealt with Jewish subjects and some of them sometimes they simply didn't. Reminds me of the line. I think Anthony Cotters had it in his in one of his publications of how Jewish is a, is a haystack uh, on a picture. Like if if you just see the picture itself, what does it really tell us about Judaism behind it or not? So. There is the famous uh, one famous painting by um, Max Lieberman, which I think was this play, or maybe it's even owned, I don't know, by the Jewish Museum in New York, um, where he depicts a chicken. And if you don't look closely, there's nothing Jewish in a chicken. But if you look very closely, there is a tiny detail, and it has a little kosher mark uh, <laughs> there. And uh, that probably was not an accident that it was a, you know, Max Lieberman who you know, by many standards, you would call very assimilated Berlin Jew, but in many ways, you also very much identified as a Jew. Um, and by the way, in 1933, he uh, wrote this letter to uh, uh, to Bialik and to Dizengov, the mayor of Tel Aviv, where he's, and now I'm paraphrasing it, but where he said, uh, you know, what happened now, uh, 1933, um, with Hitler coming to power, affects every German Jew, but us assimilated Jews more than anyone else, because we are uh, realizing that we have dreamed, we, we, we're waking up of a dream, which was nothing more than a dream. Um, but I also want to mention, since I think uh, I forgot Rachel or Carrie mentioned that before, uh, the Jewish Museum of Berlin, it, what an irony that its official opening in this wonderful uh, with with amazing art objects, the wonderful the, the opening took place uh, in uh, January of, uh, 1933, uh, exactly uh, a few days before Hitler was elected, and then actually there was a or not elected was was appointed uh, chancellor, and then even in March, um, early March, when the Reichstag was already in flames. Um, was destroyed by, you know, by, by, by arsoning. Um, an official Prussian delegation came to the Jewish Museum of Berlin and had words of praise. What a sad timing for the opening of the then Jewish Museum of Berlin. This, well, yeah, Rachel, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, please. Uh, uh, Carrie, Jakob Steinhardt immigrated to Palestine, right? In the 30s. Yeah. So, I mean, that's also interesting, right? It, it, here's a figure who is kind of rubbing elbows, schmoozing with all of these non-Jewish artists in Paris. And then, you know, part of this Jewish, not Jewish scene in Berlin, and then ends up in Palestine. And I think, you know, today he's largely seen in, as an Israeli artist, you know, probably if you look him up online, that's kind of the first thing that that would come up. And so I, I think, you know, in part when we talk, maybe to get back to your question, Miriam, about shared history and who's sharing in it, I mean, maybe it's really, it's really above all a disciplinary question, you know, when we're talking about shared history, it's like, who, which um, scholars have an opportunity to kind of share in these stories in a way that doesn't sort of reduce or pigeonhole these particular figures that we tend to um, 
plop into certain categories, be it Israeli, Zionist, Expressionist, um, you know, Berliner, um, because ultimately these, it's, these individual figures, when we look at their biographies and we look at their contributions, as, as Carrie pointed out, it's so much more complex. You know, they wake up and paint a kosher chicken one day and the next day um, they're painting a, a beautiful sunset over on a bridge, you know, so it's, um, I think, I think that's one of the things, and, and if we're talking about also how far we've come in the study of Weimar Jewish culture in the last quarter century, that's one of the big discoveries, or not discoveries, but maybe um, steps forward, I think that's been made is that we're realizing that the disciplinary borders are so much more porous than we would like, because it would be so much easier <laughs> if we could just fit everyone into a single category. Um, but, you know, it depends on dates of immigration, um, colleagues that they, that they, that they work together with and, and so many other factors. Um, yeah. Okay, we, by, by now we have plenty of questions also and remarks in the Q&A. Um, so we covered some of the topics or points that were raised already. Um, one thing that keeps reappearing uh, is, of course, the question of the place of Berlin, that what we do is kind of equating um, this tendency of speaking of Weimar um, and uh, definitely not speaking of all of Weimar Republic or Germany or even Europe, but of Berlin. Um, so what is indeed the place of Berlin and what, what were other centers uh, maybe? And uh, then the gender question reappears because uh, you mentioned quite a lot of women. So some of the questions were addressing uh, the specific role and um, options women had um, in this, in this period and of course um, we did we did indeed not not explicitly at least address anti-semitism yet as one of the big limitations of a free development and uh, involvement of, of Jewish culture in the Weimar Republic and of course as the the, the fact that ended this whole heyday of um, German Jewish culture um, maybe we should leave it at that for the moment. So it's anti-Semitism, the role of women and the place of Berlin. Who wants to address one of the points? It's, it's all, it, it leaves room for, for quite some bookshelves to fill, but maybe in a nutshell, someone, Michael. I'd be happy to. Um, all of if I, I, I glance through the question, they're really great questions, I should say, which doesn't always happen in these events. Uh, so thank you for this great input from the audience. Um, and we probably would take a long time to answer them all. Uh, I'll be very brief. Anti-Semitism, um, yes, was very central because um, after the events of the of World War One and its aftermath. Anti-Semitism was clearly in the, on the rise, especially violent uh, anti-Semitism, um, different anti-Semitism than before the war. And it did contribute to the fact that Jews um, were more and more reminded that they were Jews. And it's one of the, um, of the my favorite quotes uh, I came across in the Frankfurt, uh, the Frankfurt Jewish Lehrhouse, when one of the, actually it was Franz Rosenzweig's physician, Richard Koch, who said, well, we are increasingly reminded by others that we are Jews, but we don't know what it means to be a Jew. So we want to learn what it means to be a Jew. I think that was for many a reason to study Jewish texts, to maybe study even Hebrew, and for some to practice religion. That was, of course, only for a smaller group. Um, in terms of... Um, Yes, the city, Berlin, um, uh, I am always in favor of not overemphasizing uh, <laughs> Berlin, being in Munich, uh, of course. Um, and I tried in my book to, you know, there's the Frankfurt Jewish Lehrhaus, there's all the efforts in communities like Munich and Hamburg and Cologne, but even in smaller places, um, although this modernist culture, of course, was much more urban 
<clears throat> uh, culture. Um, but we also shouldn't forget that about almost one third of German Jews actually lived in Berlin by 1933. And finally, and I'm sure others have say more about it, but uh, yes, it was also the period that women became very important um, in, in terms in, as creators of art, of literature, but also in uh, to a certain degree um, in, in religious Jewish life and, and other forms of Jewish expression at the time. I mean, take somebody like Bertha Pappenheim, for example, played an enormous role. And of course, Marion Kaplan has written a lot about these aspects. I'll just add to, I'll just add to that, you know, one third of, of Jews were in Berlin and about a quarter of Berlin's Jews around that time were East European Jews. So as far as, you know, migrant uh, Jews are concerned, I mean, Berlin really was the place to be. Of course, they were in other places as well. And even among the prominent writers, Agnon, for example, was found himself in different cities in, in Germany um, over the 12 years that he spent there. Um, but Berlin was unique, and, and I think in particular for those coming from um, the uh, from the former Russian Empire, where a new kind of Bolshevik order was just being put in place, the fact that Berlin was also a very welcoming place to people with sort of left-leaning political tendencies, be they socialists or communists, that also was significant. You know, it wasn't just the kind of cultural experimentation and the kind of live and let live attitude that characterized Berlin, but also the fact that it was, you know, as the as the Nazis would later describe it, it was the the reddest city after Moscow, right? Um, so there was also a reason that I think Berlin had that appeal for a lot of the East European um, Jews. And it's interesting, I think, to think about, to, to maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself, but to compare all of this to what's going on with um, Jews migrating to Germany today. And if we look at Israelis, for example, where, what are they attracted to? It's, it's Berlin. Um, you know, they're, they've since spread out further. I have happened to have a cousin who immigrated from Tel Aviv to Berlin and now is, is, um, uh, the cantor of the Jüdische Gemeinde Mannheim, uh, and feels very rooted in Mannheim. The same thing happened a hundred years ago, right? So, but, but it's, it's, um, Berlin, Berlin is unique. Berlin, Berlin was the point of attraction. And of course, we can't overemphasize its centrality, but we do have to remember that it was also different than other cities in Germany. Mm. Terry, you also wanted to say something, right? Sure, just very briefly. Um, my understanding also of the way that the modern art movements kind of traveled around and developed, uh, especially different expressionist groups, is that Munich was especially prominent um, in the early year, in the early decades of the 20th century, but sort of decreased in prominence uh, in the 1910s, um, when we have people like um, in the early part of that decade, we have people like Elsa Lasker Schuller, even in, in conversation with expressionists like Franz Marc, who are based in Munich, um, and uh, really engaging in that, that, that particular location as a base. Um, but after 1910, the Visual Arts Center, uh, at least, shifted toward Berlin um, more significantly. So Berlin actually rose in prominence, uh, also through its connections to, to different um, expressionist groups that are that were closer to Berlin and Dresden and in Berlin um, and uh, just, just very briefly to comments on on the question of, of gender and women and how women were involved um, e even though women had new rights in the Weimar period and new opportunities they also sometimes found that the best way to get involved in Jewish um, life was to have found their own organizations, found women's organizations. Um, and so we see the emergence uh, with Bertha Pappenheim, for example, of the Frauenbund, but there were, that wasn't the only one. Um, and we see several different Jewish women's organizations, Jewish women's periodicals, Jewish women um, gathering under different auspices uh, in and amongst themselves, uh, and then also participating, of course, in, in broader community life. Um, and uh, that is to say also that many different women's organizations during this period had nothing to do with being Jewish. So there were plenty of Jewish women who were involved in organizations for women that were not specifically Jewish organizations, um, including women 
women artists groups, um, et cetera, uh, that, that made opportunities for them to cre create and contribute culture um, independent of Jewish circles. Um, I, ha I have more to say, but I think I'd rather move on to some other topics. Well, but maybe you could, if you want to continue, because one another question was um, that came in the Q and A is, um, or that was raised in the Q and A was uh, Jews by name only. Like, if you talk about those, uh, you just mentioned the, the Jews who were not really Jewish women who were working in in, in women's organizations, for example. Um, but also, I think the question related to to people like Kurt Weil, et etc., who were not like the non Jewish Jews. Um, that we as scholars maybe made, Jew, made them, turned them into Jews, or the Nazis did. So which role would they play in your, in your picture? Not only yours, Kerry, but also Rachel and Michael. Well, I, 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 I like that question about Kurt Weil and Schoenberg because it is really complicated uh, with these and many other figures. Uh, uh, Peter Gay once said about the Three Penny Opera, uh, should we now assume that the lyrics um, is, is, um, is, is like non-Jewish, is uh, Christian or German or whatever you call it, and, and uh, the music is Jewish because Bertolt Brecht was not Jewish and Kurt Weil was Jewish, of course not. And uh, at the same time, there was, all the, there was also, maybe later, uh, especially an interest uh, in, in his Jewish side by Kurt Weil, but much more so in, in Schoenberg. Schoenberg had converted to Protestantism in 1898 in Vienna. And um, during the 1920s, he um, gradually turned uh, back to Judaism um, also, um, anti-Semitism played a, a, a large role when he was turned away at, a, for example, at a hotel in Austria because of his Jewish sounding name, uh, or people knew he or thought he was Jewish, although he was Protestant by then. And he actually wrote a very Zionist uh, play, which was not published then. Uh, and he also um, officially returned to Judaism, he went to a rabbi in 1933. That already was under the impact of Hitler, but it had started much earlier. And of course, he'd written Moses and Aaron before. But he, he went to a synagogue in Paris uh, and said, I want to officially return to Judaism. And he took a quite prominent witness with him. That was Marc Chagall, uh, who, who, who came with him. So you have these, you have others like, uh, uh, the famous writer Amy Ludwig, or many others, who um, in some cases had converted. Well, in fact, the successor of Franz Rosenzweig as the director of the uh, Lehrhaus in Frankfurt. I mean, Rosenzweig almost converted, but his successor, Rudolf Hallo, actually did convert and returned uh, and, and, and became one of the initiators of a movement of strengthening Jewish literature. So you do have this movement return. Of course, you still have the other uh, movement as well. But I think what is new is that you have many Jews now interested in some form of return. We, we ha oh, Rachel, did you raise your hand? No, ah, no, you didn't. Um, we have an interesting question here on um, Martin Buber, or let's say, how, how did the Jewish Renaissance idea of the Weimar Republic draw on or relate to, to the early 1901 Martin Buber essay and idea of, of Jewish Renaissance, uh, and also on, on Zionist ideas or conceptualizations of, of maybe cultural nation building? Who? Should I go ahead? Mm, yep. Um, I mean, Buber, in a way, I would say was the guru for many young German Jews uh, who were looking for um, authenticity, for a way uh, to find this really, uh, well, authentic Judaism. Um, and they got it in a way in the form of Buber's already 
kind of westernized version of the Hasidic tales. Um, Gershom Sholem once spoke a little, you know, made a little ridicule of that and called it, it's hard to translate, but he called it Bubatet. The German Jews are in the Bubatet. They meant, he meant, of course, Pubatet, puberty, uh, uh, but um, called it the Bubatet. And Buber, I think, was in a way almost the equivalent of somebody like Stefan Georg or such charismatic uh, leaders of the German mo youth movement. For That's what he was for the Jewish youth movement. At the same time, however, um, it wasn't just through Zion. Zionism played an important role. But uh, if you take somebody like Franz Rosenzweig, he was not a Zionist. And, and others uh, who were um, interested in uh, some kind of uh, reapproaching uh, Jewish culture were not necessarily Zionists and did not uh, ever think of emigrating themselves or even uh, supporting the Zionist project. Some were and some were not. But of course, Buber was crucial because he also created this term of Jewish Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Rachel? One of the, um, the writers that I, I did some work on, um, Gertrude Kolmar, who was a thoroughly assimi assimilated West End, you know, Berlin Jew, um, she wrote in letters to her sister about discovering Buber's Hasidic tales. And for her too, that was the entry point, right? That was her, that, that ignited her kind of fascination with this orientalized uh, Jewish East. What she wrote about, and interestingly, when there started to be a kind of renewed interest in Kolmar, um, I guess in the late 80s, 90s, as sort of part of the feminist movement to reclaim, you know, lost women's voices, uh, she was sometimes misappropriated or mislabeled uh, as a Zionist writer. And she was the farthest thing from a Zionist. She never had any intention of making Aliyah. She never had any intention of leaving Berlin, except maybe for one summer. Um, and so it's interesting that Buber um, was the kind of guru is a great, great word, better than patron saint, I guess, which sounds so, so Catholic, but he was whatever you want to call him. I think the fact that um, he could offer this kind of accessible entree into some version of Jewishness without having to sign on to a particular political ideology was very powerful. Do you, did you want to add something or okay so I I have a Jeanette who wanted to say something or raise a question please go ahead you have to unmute yourself uh, hello um, I was wondering if you could speak to the role of social institutions in the in the Weimar Republic and Jewish life such as the Jewish hospital in Berlin Well, we, we did mention the, the women's organizations, right? Does someone want to say something about the Jüdische Frauenbund or other? I think the social welfare organizations became extremely important um, because I think I saw also in the chat one question about um, the economic situation and if the, I forgot how it was phrased, but if, if, if the economic... Uh, well-to-do situation enabled it. I think it was a bit the other way around. The 20s, also for German Jews, were a time of crisis, also economically for many, not for all, but for many. Um, the inflation in the early 20s, well, it enabled the Hebrew uh, printing or the Yiddish printing houses, but that was because they were paid from outside of Germany. But, but for those Jews who were in Germany, um, it meant oft a, there was a lot of talk about pauperization of German Jews. And then, of course, again, uh, in, in 1929, uh, with the crash, uh, that, that's another moment where um, something interesting happened. Uh, those Jews who now 
uh, became dependent on welfare institutions were often not so much helped by the city of Berlin or Munich, but by the local Jewish community. And I, my theory would be that it was also for many that moment where they were dependent on outside help that they were thrown into the Jew, back into the Jewish community, which they didn't leave officially, but which many of them had much to do with. And this, the, the, the city of Berlin or, or Munich or Frankfurt, uh, those city administrations were happy because there was another institution. Of course, you could also mention the churches, which also helped, but the Jewish community helped its members too. So there was a big like unemployment um, assistance organization, Berlin Jewish community. Um, there were uh, banks which gave um, loans to Jewish unemployed. Uh, and of course, among many of the immigrants, uh, the pauperization, many of them weren't rich anyway when they came, um, uh, was, was very clear. So I, I think there is a connection and we see uh, growth so much of those institutions um, that the um, one of the major parties running for the uh, Berlin, running for to control the Jewish community of Berlin, it was really a, a, a real election campaign with parties. So the liberals were the traditional party, but then there were the Zionist, the, the, the Jewish Volkspartei, the Jewish People's Party, which was not just Zionist. Uh, and they called for the Jewish Volksgemeinde, for a Jewish people's community. And um, and, and, and they didn't emphasize synagogues and the cemetery and other expenses as much as social welfare organization, the hospital, which was mentioned and so on. So the Jewish community was in a period of transformation and we shouldn't forget the Jewish community in Germany was and still is, it's not congregations in the, in the American sense. The Jewish community is one institution. There is an institution called the Jewish community of Berlin or of Munich which which every member supports through their tax, through their income tax. Uh, Carrie, did you want to say something? Because I think I interrupted you before. Okay, so because then I we tried to address, let's say, the gist of of the the questions that reached us in the Q and A section and um i i would now to to have like i would love to have like a final round of sh short statements maybe with which could also invite our audience and listeners to after this event click themselves through the shared history project um if you so it's it's actually a twofold question one part of the question would be do you have like an object in that exhibit that you think tells the history of Weimar Germany or of German Jewish history in general, the best? Do you have like one of those? Is, is there a best of in your view of those objects so far in the exhibit? And the other question would be um, asking you from sitting in Germany, having the German newspapers and Feta uh, every day celebrating 1,700 years of German Jewish friendship and history I, i'm exaggerating but how what is your take on this this um, surprising german enthusiasm of today of those supposedly 100 1700 years of joined german jewish history so brief statements maybe i don't know who wants to go first you don't have to answer both questions of course questions <laughs> Well, I, I can't speak to the contemporary German enthusiasm for this kind of momentous anniversary um, because I'm not there right now and I'm not, I don't, I don't know exactly what the reaction is. Um, but I think that from my perspective, one thing that's interesting in looking back on this moment is the fact that we find ourselves grappling with so many of the same themes and questions vis-a-vis -vis Jewish life in Germany that we continue to grapple with as cultural historians looking back at the Weimar period. Um, 
this whole question, for instance, I've been following now, um, one thing I've been following lately in the German media is this whole kind of scandal that erupted over Gil Ofarim, the, um, the, the German singer who uh, claimed on social media that he was wearing a Jewish star and was discriminated against in a hotel in Leipzig. And now video footage has come out questioning whether he even was wearing the star at the time of the incident. And was this an anti-Semitic attack or was it not? Did it not even happen or did it not happen as he remembered it? And how much, um, what a huge topic this has become, this, this one particular incident um, and someone who identifies as, um, you know, a German Jew of Israeli origin, um, not an immigrant, but very much German, but what does it mean to be a German Jew today? So many of these same fundamental questions are, you know, fueling debates that it feels like we've, we've heard um, so many times in the past. Um, and then, of course, there's the fact that we look at German Jewish, what is the German Jewish community or German Jewish population today? And to what extent does its diversity bring to mind the diversity that we're trying to kind of piece together of the Jewish population in the Weimar period? You know, in the same way that we're trying now, uh, that we're trying as, as scholars and as historians to look back and say the picture was much more multifaceted than we once thought, um, by the same token, the picture of Jewish life in Germany today is, is remarkably complex with, you know, the influx of Jews from former Soviet countries, with the influx of Israelis, with um, Sfaradim and Ashkenazim and Mizrahim. And um, so it's, it just seems like this is, I'm not going back 1700 years, but even just going back 100 years, how um, striking it is that so many of these basic questions that we're all asking, we're still, we're still asking today. Karen? Yeah. Sure, um, I'm, I'm gonna take your questions a little more literally, uh, Miriam, and um, one object in the Shared History Project that I think is particularly interesting um, is the Grafenberg Ring IUD, which looks at some of the early um, campaigns for uh, birth control and sex reform. Um, and there's some essays by Atina Grossman that accompany that that are um, that talk a little bit about some of those those early movements uh, to campaign for women's rights. Um, and uh, I think in the broader context of thinking through also other developments in um, sexology and thinking about sexual science as a science, um, I think there's some really interesting things to unpack there. So that's one uh, object in the shared history project that I think is really interesting. And I think it is also interesting to think through this as a project of objects. Um, so it's more than an, um, a regular art exhibition where we think about it through visual art. And it's different in thinking about what the objects can teach us. Um, but just also to comment on the 1700 years um, I'm sure this is something that everyone is, is thinking as well, but it's um, it's not a 1700 year period without ruptures. It's not a continuous 17 year period. And so to think to think about 1700 years in which there might be some space for shared history and shared commonalities um, is interesting and important because it makes a campaign for the Jewish right to belonging in Germany. I think that's, that is sort of at the heart of that um, principle. And it's already a concept that was being embraced in the Weimar period, um, this sort of idea going back to, to 321 or what have you of um, Jews in German speaking lands for, for such a long period of time. Um, and at that time, it was also, it was a response to antisemitism, it was a response to people who would say that Jews did not belong in Germany. So it was um, really an, an advocacy, an activist effort to say, um, no, Jews do belong in Germany. And I think that's what we're seeing today too, perhaps in response to, um, as Rachel was mentioning, um, some of the antisemitism that's arisen in the last few years. Um, maybe again, we're asking the question of, do Jews belong in Germany? Do Jews belong in Europe? Do Jews belong in the United States? These are, these are the big questions that are at the heart of making the case for shared history. And I think there's a reason to make that case. It's a very political one. <laughs> 
I, I would like to 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 continue exactly where you left off. I, I always also think that we, after a long time where Jewish history was seen very much as a history of uh, persecution and victims, and especially the Holocaust, we are we shouldn't also fall into the other extreme to see it as a celebratory history. Um, and um, and uh, by the way, we don't know that much. We know hardly anything about the first 700 of those 1700 years. Um, there are very few real documents about that, but we tried to show a few us in the exhibit. Um, and of course, it can a, a 1700 year history, uh, again, like Kerry said, it's not a history of a continuity. It, it is a presence of Jews in Germany for 1700 years. And at the same time, it is the history of a continuous immigration, immigration and expulsion and leaving and wandering, but also immigration in, and certainly in the 20th century and even 21st century. And uh, the last uh, remark, well, uh, my favorite object, and uh, it's really not so much about a top topic today, um, is, the, uh, is the film clip of the 1932 uh, soccer championship between Bayern Munich and Frankfurt. I admit I'm a Bayern fan, and that was their first championship, 1932. But what an irony, both their manager and their, the club president were Jewish. And they, and a few months later, of course, uh, they were no longer the manager and the president of the club, as you can imagine. And um, there is, uh, with the, you know, as with so many things people think are so local and not at all related to Jewish history, the history of Bayern Munich is totally related to to Bayern to 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 to, to Jews, and it was often um, even by anti-Semites called. The Jews Club. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, all our panelists and uh, Michael Brenner in DC and Kerry Wallach in Gettysburg and Rachel Zielik in mm -hmm. Toronto. And um, thanks all for being with us. And I'll now hand over to Billy. Yeah, um, David got knocked off the internet, but it's back. But I'll take the opportunity to say how much I enjoyed so much what, what all all of you brought um, to this uh, from your individual work and then the, the, this last 20 minutes or so tying it to much larger issues, um, both uh, historical and how it sheds light on the contemporaries. So uh, on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute, please accept our, our gratitude. Uh, and, I, and we had an incredibly large crowd, um, larger than usual, which uh, says something about the topic and the people. And um, we very much hope that people will track our uh, events and join us for more about the Shared History Project and many other um, things that we are doing. So um, please stay in touch with the Leo Beck Institute. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. I'll just um, jump in to, hello? Uh oh. Yep. Um, I'll just jump in to say quickly that um, we do have a few things coming up that you should check our website, www.lbi.org. Um, you know, in particular, uh, later this month, October 28th, our book club meets and there's still room um, to um, discuss uh, Feuchtwang, Leon Feuchtwanger's The Oppermans with special guest Peter Yelovich in a sort of intimate book club setting. Um, we're having our first uh, live event with the American Society for Jewish Music um, on Tuesday, November 9th. Uh, that'll be live here at the Center for Jewish History, um, a memorial concert uh, uh, on Kristallnacht and its aftermath. Um, and the next installment of our event series on the Shared History Project will be Tuesday, November 16th. Um, and we will have uh, three scholars um, who've done uh, groundbreaking recent work in Holocaust studies, Anna Haikova, Joanna Sliwa, and Elizabeth Anthony, and they'll be discussing um, new approaches to the history of the Holocaust as the Shared History Project um, moves on to that phase. Um, and there are a number of other events, uh, so I just encourage you to um, 
go to www.ldi.org, sign up for our email list if you haven't already, and uh, please join us at some of those events coming up. And uh, Miriam, uh, Michael, Carrie, um, Rachel, thank you all so much.